believe that, but in practical measures, sometimes we fail to uh, think about the Spirit as much as we should. It's one thing to have the Holy Spirit overlooked in our songs. It's something else to have the Holy Spirit overlooked in our lives. And so we're going to get right after it this morning. I wonder how often this third member of the Trinity is is pushed aside in, in each one of our lives. The Holy Spirit shares equal status with the Father. The Holy Spirit shares equal status with the Son. It's what we call Trinity. The responsibilities of the Holy Spirit are, are many. I'm going to give you just a few this morning. In fact, we're going to start in a totally different way. And um, Imagine yourself sitting in a seminary class and you signed up for Pneumatology 101, the study of the Holy Spirit. So we're going we're gonna to be quick, and we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time, but we're going to give you a quick course to try to set the, 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 the foundation for where we're going in our study of the book of Acts this morning. As the other members of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit is distinct and eternal in his personhood. The Holy Spirit is equal status with the Father and the Son. Uh, John 14, 16 says this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. A little bit later in one of my favorite chapters of John, John 14, uh, John 14, 26 says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Time does not allow us to go in depth on, on the Spirit's personhood and the Spirit's work. But the Holy Spirit carries the attributes of God. He's omniscient. He knows all. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful, seen in his work in creation. The Holy Spirit can do only the actions that God can do. He's an agent in the virgin birth. I mean, our, our auditorium is a beautiful uh, this morning. We're getting into Advent season. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to start focusing on the, when Christ came to earth. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and his name will be Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the agent in that. He's the vehicle used in the writing for the inspired word of God that you're holding in your hands right now. He's involved in the creation of the world. The whole work of the Holy Spirit is vast. And if we were actually in a seminary class, we would spend the entire semester diving into the great work of the Holy Spirit. Here's a quick list for you. It's not an exhaustive list, but the Holy Spirit is involved in teaching. The Holy Spirit is involved in guiding. The Holy Spirit is involved in assuring. The Holy Spirit is involved in praying. The Holy Spirit is involved in creation. The Holy Spirit is involved in convicting of sin. The Holy Spirit is involved in restraining evil. The Holy Spirit is involved in regeneration, regenerating, indwelling, baptizing, sealing, filling, gifting, and the list could continue on. That's a lot of information dump for only being 10 minutes into our service this morning. There wasn't even a cute little story to start us today, but it's, a, it's the foundation for where we need to go as we think about uh, Acts chapter 19, as we think about the work of the Spirit in Acts chapter 19. I don't want to forget about the work of the Spirit in our lives. My goal in our time together in the book of Acts this morning is that we leave with a freshness of the gift of the Holy Spirit to each of us that have called upon the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God who dwells within all who call upon his name. We looked at these attributes, but 
we're going to look at a few of them in more depth in just a minute or two. But to set the backdrop for where we've been. We're on Paul's uh, second missionary journey. Uh, he's about to head home. We saw him at Sencre uh, last Sunday morning. He cut his hair and that put him on a timeline to try to get to Jerusalem. He had a port stop and, uh, in Ephesus and he only spent uh, a little bit of time there. He, he spoke in the synagogue and the leaders of the synagogue invited him, wanted him to stay. But Paul, in an uncharacteristic move, said, no, we need to keep moving. We need to keep going. He told him, I'll be back to Ephesus if God wills. And that's what we're going to see uh, in, our, in our study in, in the book of Acts this morning as he returns uh, to Ephesus. We also saw and met another servant of God, Apollos. Well, Paul left Ephesus and went eventually back to Jerusalem and to Antioch. Apollos came to Ephesus, and he was a powerful speaker. He's, he was described as being powerful in, in God's word, dynamic in God's word. But he didn't have a complete understanding of some of the things that we just talked about today, of the Holy Spirit and, and, and the, how the Holy Spirit works in somebody's life. So Aquila and Priscilla take Apollos aside, and they share with him more completely what the Spirit is doing. Apollos takes that information and heads across the bay to Corinth, and he, again, spreads that uh, gospel, a uh, more completed understanding of who Jesus is and how the Holy Spirit works, and uh, he is a minister at Corinth. And that gets us back to where we're going to start today hope you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 19. Uh, we're going to meet the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 19 today. Paul has now made his way back to Ephesus on his third missionary journey. In Acts 19, verse number 1, uh, is where we meet the Spirit there. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there were all about 12 men. In this little rather interesting and somewhat confusing paragraph that begins Acts chapter 19, Paul is back in Ephesus. This time he's going to stay for a bit, up to three years even. Ephesus would become Paul's home base operations of his third missionary journey. The city of Ephesus. Ephesus was where the home of the temple Artemis was. It was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. According to its ruins, the foundation of this temple was 239 feet wide and 418 feet long. This is a big, big building. It's four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. Ephesus was a commercial center, much like Corinth. Ephesus was the leading city in their province of Asia. Look back at verse 1 one more time. And it happened while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. This is where things began to get a little confusing in this paragraph, and they're going to compound as we walk through it. After arriving in this first century booming city, Paul, Paul found some disciples. We needed to find what is meant by the term disciple. When we think of disciple, most of the time we think of the 12 disciples, followers of Jesus, committed to Jesus. Was that what these guys were? Or were they something slightly different? There's been a lot of controversy on trying to define, were these disciples disciples? quote, Christians, unquote, 
Or were they followers uh, of God without really understanding who Jesus is and was at that time? But look at verse number two. It kind of helps us in that. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So these disciples were believers. They believed. They believed in, in Jesus Christ, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. They're kind of like Apollos was in last week's text. They understand some things about Jesus. They understood a very little about the Holy Spirit. And remember with Apollos, Aquila and Priscilla pulled him aside and began to teach him so he could have a completer understanding. And that's what Paul is then going to do with, with these guys called disciples here in Ephesus. So look at verse number two with me. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. As we already mentioned, the work of the Holy Spirit is vast. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes the moment somebody trusts in Jesus Christ. That's the normal. Now we're going to look for just a moment at an exception here in our text. We'll call this the exception. You know, in, in English, we have I before E, except after C. We're going to look at the C here in our text. Um, why in the world, if these guys were believing in Jesus Christ, why hadn't the Holy Spirit already indwelled them? He said, no, we haven't heard about the Holy Spirit. Paul was there to fill the gaps. Some take this passage as a proof text that one can receive Christ and not the Holy Spirit, and that it's still today there could be a second work of the Holy Spirit in one's life. That's not what this text is saying. In order to understand this text, we really have to understand the genre in which we read this text. We're in the book of Acts. It's a transitional book. And by the word genre, at least for some in this auditorium, I just sent a chill down the spine of any student that ever walked through GHS and their multi-genre paper. You know, as parents of students and students themselves, uh, that multi-genre paper where there are different kind of writings they had to put together in a, in a paper. We have to understand the kind of writings that we're seeing here. And Acts is, is a transition. Sometimes things happen in the book of Acts that are not normal for this day, for our day. And that's what we're going to see. The church is in the infancy stages. God's word had not been completed. In fact, while Paul is on his missionary journeys, what's he doing? He's writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. A lot of God's word. So there's some things that sometimes happen differently in the book of Acts. That's what we have here. We have a group of people that had believed in Jesus but their knowledge was incomplete and now they're going to get a complete knowledge uh, we've seen this before if you've been with us through our whole study you should mine should go back to Acts chapter 8 when we are in Samaria with with Philip in his ministry there and Peter and John come from Jerusalem we have the believers the Samaritans believing but the Holy Spirit not coming into their lives till Peter and John come down from Jerusalem. Why? It was to solidify for everybody that Samaritans and Jews were on equal footing and that the Holy Spirit indwelled both. And here, I think, it's again, for God's purposes in Ephesus, the Holy Spirit didn't come uh, to these men for, for purposes that are not stated for us necessarily, um, that it was an exception taking place here. So even though they, I, they were believing in Jesus Christ, they had not received the Holy Spirit. But remember, the normal in the Holy Spirit's work is when you trust in Jesus Christ, instantaneously the Holy Spirit moves into your life. Uh, that's why we started with our opening uh, lesson or class on pneumatology, uh, our Holy Spirit theology lesson. One of the things that the Holy Spirit does is he regenerates. The Holy Spirit is the one that brings a new life. He has to indwell at the moment of salvation because he's the one who is bringing new life 
uh, to the person. Think back to uh, John chapter 3. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And to Nicodemus, he says a lot of things. Uh, we got John 3.16 in there for sure. But before that happens, verse number 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of the water of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone born of the Spirit. Remember that conversation's open with Nicodemus seeking Jesus at night, and Jesus saying, you must be born again. And now he's explaining what that means. You need to be born of the water. You need to be born of the Spirit. The Spirit gives life. And when the Spirit gives a new life to the believer, He moves into the believer's heart and He indwells the believer. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says this, Do you not know that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? You know, we no longer need the Ark of the Covenant in the presence of God uh, amongst the people because we have the Holy Spirit that is the presence of God among the people in, in our lives. He indwells us, and that happens at the, at the moment of salvation. He moves into our lives. And one of, the, one of the descriptors of that is being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Being baptized by the Holy Spirit simply means that the Holy Spirit has moved in to your life. We see this in our text uh, in just a minute, but uh, first uh, look at it in 1 Corinthians 12, number 13. For by one Spirit you are baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. We're all made to drink from one Spirit. We'll talk about this baptizing a little bit more here, but uh, he, in, he, he immerses into the believer's life. While doing that, he seals the believer. He puts the God stamp on him as, the, as, as, the, as, as God, as part of the Trinity. He signs our adoption papers that make us the children of God by, by sealing us. Romans 8.16 says this, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're the children of God. Ephesians 1.13, In him... You also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You see, the moment somebody trusts in Jesus Christ, the moment somebody in their heart puts their faith in Christ, understanding that they're a sinner, understanding that there is nothing they can do about their sin, repenting of their sin, trusting in Jesus Christ at that moment the Holy Spirit does all the things we just described and it's at that moment that new life comes they're instantaneous at the moment of salvation without except for our exception here in, in, in the book of Acts that we're looking at look at 1 Corinthians six nineteen up there for you 19 and 20 do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own? You bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. We're going to think about that in just a moment. We're bought with a price. We're going to have opportunity in a service uh, to celebrate that fact uh, with, with the communion. The blood of Jesus Christ brings us forgiveness of sin. The Spirit's work in salvation is all the things that we just described. Now back to our text. Baptism. In this text, like I said, this, this paragraph is slightly confusing in a, in a sense that, uh, you know, first we have the issue of these guys, these 12 men in Ephesus that had trusted in Christ, but the Holy Spirit hadn't moved in their lives. That's about to change. How that changes, we're going to see through the mode of baptism. Now, just so I can try to be very, very clear with you, in our text, we're going to see three different baptisms referenced, okay? And hopefully, if you have questions afterwards, we can, we can sit and talk. 
Um, look at verse number three. Then he, that's Paul, said, into what then have you been baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is Jesus. Now, like Apollos, these, these Ephesian disciples only knew of John's baptism. That's what Apollos said to Aquila and Priscilla last Sunday. John's baptism. What is John's baptism? John's baptism is a baptism of water looking for, looking forward to the repentance of sin. Remember, John was the announcer of Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he announced Jesus and he baptized people unto repentance, not for repentance, but looking forward to the repentance that's going to come in Jesus. That's John's baptism. That's the only baptism that they knew about. Like last week, Aquila and Priscilla walk Apollos through this more complete knowledge of Jesus and this more complete knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Paul does the same thing here. So the text goes from John's baptism to believer's baptism. Baptism of water. Look at verse 5. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we move from John's baptism looking forward to repentance. Once people trusted in Jesus Christ and understood the work of Jesus Christ, uh, that's why we have a baptistry over here. That's why we occasionally get opportunity to baptize people. It looks back to the repentance that has already taken place, looking back to uh, the believer identifying with Jesus Christ with his death going in the water, with his resurrection coming out of the water, with the newness of, of life that we have in Christ. So these, these Ephesian men were baptized with John's baptism. Then they're rebaptized with believer's baptism. By the way, this is the only reference in Scripture that I can find anyway that somebody's been rebaptized. But they're rebaptized uh, with believer's baptism after they had that more complete, strengthened information about both Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But those two baptisms weren't the only baptism that took place that day. We have the baptism of the Spirit taking place that day. Look at verse number 6. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there was about 12 men. So this third baptism we're talking about today is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It occurs once when, at the moment of salvation, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, one spirit, we were baptized into one body. I'm guessing, well, these guys were still wet. As they came up out of the water, after their believer's baptism, the Holy Spirit then comes down and indwells them, moves into their lives, and as a result, they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. We've seen many occasions on this book. When the Holy Spirit comes, something supernatural takes place in the book of Acts every time the Holy Spirit comes as an outward um, demonstration that the Holy Spirit has arrived. Even though we don't necessarily always see the outward demonstration, when you trusted in Jesus Christ, when you said, Jesus, take my sin, the Holy Spirit moved into your life, and guess what? Something equally supernatural took place within you as the Holy Spirit moved into your life. Here, we have it demonstrated in speaking in tongues. It's those known languages that we've talked about a time or two as we walk through the book of Acts. We see it in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost. It confirmed that the Holy Spirit had moved in. We see him prophesy, speaking the words of God. Remember, the genre in which we are in in the book of Acts. The Bible hasn't been completed yet. Right now, this is our authority. But until this was completed, this supernatural outcoming or outpouring of the Holy Spirit is seen over and over again to authenticate the work of God in these men's lives. So they were baptized by the water twice. 
John's baptism, looking forward to repentance. Believer's baptism, looking back at the repentance and what was found in Jesus Christ. And spirit baptism, when the Holy Spirit moves, moved in to their lives. In each of these cases, the Holy Spirit arrived in the lives of believers. I mean, they, the Holy Spirit arrived uh, when people trusted in, in Jesus Christ in the book of Acts. Sometimes he delayed, as we see uh, in, in Acts 8, and then we see it here in Acts 19. But that's the exception. The rule is, the moment you trust in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. So, for us this morning, there's only two categories of people in God's economy. Those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and have the Holy Spirit, and those who have not trusted in Jesus Christ and don't have the Holy Spirit. Those who have the Holy Spirit have all the power of God available to them as the Holy Spirit leads them and guides them in all those things we talked about when we started our time together. If you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ, What's stopping you? You have the God who created all. You have the God who uh, had a virgin conceive. You have a God who spoke the world into his existence that wants to move into your life. Forgive your sin. Give you a relationship with him. Give you eternity with him. If you need to trust in Christ today, please, please do that. Tap me on the shoulder before we leave. Talk to somebody on your row. But for those of us entrusted in Jesus Christ, I have one sentence for you. You have God in you. You have God in you. You have the power of God in living and residing in you. And I'm convinced that the church of Jesus Christ could halfway understand that. We'd be different people. We'd be different people. What's our acts for today? In this rather interesting and somewhat confusing paragraph that begins Acts chapter 19, we see this. We have the beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. To do all the things we talked about this morning, that gift came the moment you trusted in Jesus Christ. That gift includes teaching you, guiding you, assuring you, interpreting your prayers before the throne room of God, convicting you of sin, restraining evil, and then at the moment of salvation, regenerating you, indwelling you, baptizing you, filling you, sealing you, giving you gifts. Oh man, we could just speak for hours on the Holy Spirit and the benefits of Him being in your life. He's a truly great gift. God Almighty in our hearts and our lives. It should humble us. I love watching birds. I don't like what birds typically do to my car, but I love watching birds. And there's two types of birds. A bird like an eagle. How majestic as it just kind of glides and flies. And a bird like a goose, who when they fly, just working their little wings off, not getting too high. You know, I'm told that eagles seek uh, what they call warm air thermals that come up from the earth. And they find these, these thermals or these lifts of warm air that is coming up from the earth and they will just glide from one thermal to another thermal, never expending much energy. And then some of these thermals can get them so high that they can see everything. And then when they see their prey, they can glide down, fly down with the strength and the power and the speed that we know an eagle can do, a hawk can do. So I think about these birds, and as we end this part of our service, sometimes I think we Christians are like the old nasty goose. 
in our lives. We're flapping our wings. We're trying to do everything possible to live the Christian life except tap into the power that we have with God within us. The, in this illustration, those warm thermals of air, the Holy Spirit within us that seeks the... the I mean, I'm convinced God's up in heaven shaking his head at us most of the time. And why? Why do they try so hard? We have the power of the Holy Spirit in us to make us fly. And quite frankly, it's the only way as a Christian we can fly. All other ways lead to failure. So my closing question for you this morning is, are you soaring? Are you flying? Are you tapping into the power of the Holy Spirit? I pray that you are. I pray this has been a good reminder of all that we have uh, in our life. And I just pray that we're not flapping our wings needlessly. Because when we're flapping our wings, the Bible calls that quenching the Holy Spirit. And there's commands, 1 Thessalonians 5. The Holy Spirit is God in us. Maybe, just maybe, we need to seek some forgiveness of trying to do things on our own and tap in to the awesome power of our awesome God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Lord, we thank you as we continue worshiping you that the power that we have, the indwelling spirit that we have, is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we start focusing our minds and our thoughts on that now, help us worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing together.
When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Nothing but your blood, 
righteousness to me, stands in my defense, Jesus' blood. We have opportunity right now to change focus a little bit. We've been focusing on the Holy Spirit, a member of the Trinity. We're going to end our time this morning focusing on both the love of the Father and the work of the Son, the other two members of the Trinity. The love of the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The love of the Son. Uh, come back this evening at 6 o'clock as we have opportunity to dive into the text a little bit differently of, of Matthew chapter 27 that we looked at about a month ago here in a morning service about Jesus' walk to the cross. The love of the Son. He was willing to be mocked. He was willing to be whipped. He was willing to face the humiliation that went with the cross, to face the pain that went with the cross, to stay on the cross, because he loves us. Because his blood would speak a better word. A better word than what? A better word than what Satan speaks. Satan speaks condemnation. Satan speaks eternal separation. Satan speaks hell. The better word that Jesus speak is <laughs> himself. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. A little bit later and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the better word. We come to communion today We've been told, as you know, to remember the sacrifice of Christ. In our tradition, we do that here once a month. As we walk and gather our elements in just a minute, think of that better word. Think of the forgiveness that you have. Because of that forgiveness, we have all the benefit of the Holy Spirit. That forgiveness that you have in Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we come into your presence, and Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you that you sent the Son. I thank you that you loved us so much that the price of our sin you were willing to pay. Lord, help us get at least a small understanding of that. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to celebrate communion together. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, whether this is your first time here or your hundredth and first time here, we invite you to take part of this, of this table. We also invite you to think about what your relationship with Christ is at this moment. There's sin that needs to be confessed so that you can 
honor the sacrifice of, of Jesus' blood, confess that sin. Uh, this morning, we're just going to play a video. During the video, it's a, it's a song. You can sing it if you'd like. You can meditate on the words if you'd like. You can bow and sit in your chair and pray if you'd like. Whatever you need to prepare yourself for the next moment, that's what I invite you to do. Sometime during that time, the song is roughly four minutes, four and a half minutes long. Sometime during that song, make your way either to the front or the back and gather your elements and then we will observe communion together at the end. Thank you. 
invite you to take a little cracker that represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bruised, broken. Let's thank him for his willingness to walk to the cross. Father, we hold in our hands a a little cracker that is supposed to represent all that your body went through. I think of the words of that song, what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name you have. The name of Jesus. The name of salvation. God saves. You did it with allowing your body to be broken. So Jesus, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God's word says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he gave it thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for me. Do this in remembrance. Now we hold in our hand a, a little cup of juice designed to, to represent the blood of Jesus Christ that flowed. Isaiah tells us that his body was more, marred more than any man. His blood flowed freely even before he got to the cross. So I was thinking in preparing for tonight, I, I thought about the blood that must have... Uh, must have been shed even in the praetorium as he was being whipped. The blood that was on that cross beam that he had to carry to Golgotha that Simon eventually carried for him. The blood that flowed down that middle piece of that cross. Blood for all the way back to the first covenant, the Old Testament needing to be shed for the forgiveness of sin. But this blood was different. This was a once and for all kind of shedding. Let's thank Jesus for his willingness to shed his blood. Lord Jesus, as the whips went into your back and into your chest, the spike went into your hands and your feet, as the crown of thorns went into your head, all caused blood to flow. The spear went into your dead body. Blood continued to flow. Thank you for allowing your blood to be the payment for sin. Without the shedding of your blood, there could have been no forgiveness of my sin. Lord Jesus, I thank you for paying a price that I couldn't pay. In Jesus' name, amen. God's word continues on this way. It says, he took the cup after supper, also saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Lord's table is a solemn experience but it's also a table of celebration. Forgiveness can be granted. The Holy Spirit can indwell. And as we leave our service today, we leave it with a sense of not somberness, but celebration. So I invite the worship team to come back for one last song before we go. Please stand and join us in singing.
Born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. By thy own eternal spirit, rule in all our hearts alone. By thy all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious Just a couple things before you leave. Um, if you have your tithes and offerings to give, there's a box in the back on the table. Excuse me. And uh, or out on the information table. I guess my voice is gone. Um, there are also cards in back like near the the auditorium. Uh, Please go back there and, and sign those. Uh, we give those out as encouragements to those who are shut in, and uh, it, it gives them a lift and a pickup. So uh, please stop by and pick those up. Let's end with some prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you again for the opportunity we've had to be here this morning, uh, either in service here or online. And Father, we just pray that uh, what we brought before you was honoring and pleasing to you. Uh, be with us as we go from here today. Help us to let your Holy Spirit reign in our lives and uh, give us direction in what we say and what we do. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.